Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Vikas Rao and I'm a neurosurgeon at Mission Hospital in Mission Viejo and I'm giving you a talk th this afternoon on stroke awareness with a focus on hemorrhagic stroke and what you can do to protect yourself from stroke. Uh, things I'm going to cover today, just the basics first. What is a stroke? What are the signs and symptoms of a stroke? What are the different types of stroke? And then I will talk about prevention and treatment. What can we do if you come to the hospital after having a stroke? And is there anything that can be done to stop some of these strokes from happening you know, before they actually do happen? So just to start, you know, a little introduction about myself, who I am and why am I talking to you about stroke? Uh, so I'm a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. What does that mean? That means that I'm a surgeon, meaning I do surgery. I take out brain tumors. I do spine surgery um, and, and all the things that a neurosurgeon does. But on top of that, I also have a specialty in treating stroke patients. Uh, and that means that, you know, I have specialized training for um, the treatment and prevention of strokes uh, using both surgery and minimally invasive endovascular techniques. So, um, you know, it's a, a newer specialty that neurosurgeons are kind of doing both sides of the coin when it comes to stroke treatments now. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what exactly that means. So uh, Mission Hospital uh, is a comprehensive stroke center. So just for, um, as most of you probably know, you know, we're a two campus hospital with 500 plus beds. We have a very busy ER that treats 80,000 patients annually. Um, we are a trauma center. We also have a dedicated neuroscience program with the specialized ICU, a rehab unit. We have eight neurosurgeons at the hospital. Uh, many of which are fellowship trained and specialists in different fields of surgery, of neurosurgery, of which two of us uh, have the training that I have, which is uh, for specializing in stroke treatment. We also have two radiologists on staff who do the catheter-based procedures, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So as a comprehensive stroke center, you know, we're seeing about 400 strokes a year and about a quarter of those are hemorrhagic strokes and three quarters are ischemic strokes. Uh, we have received multiple awards, uh, the most important of which is the Get With The Guidelines Gold Plus Award, uh, of which I believe are one of the highest or, or the highest uh, ranked hospital in Orange County, um, uh, definitely in Orange County, but possibly in Southern California. Um, so what that means is the hospital can provide 24-7 specialized care in multiple fields with you know, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neurointerventionalists, ICU doctors, rehab, PT, speech therapists, everyone that's uh, ready to treat stroke patients and take care of you if you are, you know, if you suffer a stroke. So back to, you know, the basics, what is a stroke and, and how do we define it? So, you know, it's a term that's thrown around a lot and, and sometimes it's unclear exactly what a stroke is and, and what that means to say that someone had a stroke. A stroke is a brain injury that's caused when a blood vessel in the brain becomes blocked, bursts, or, or something else happens to it which causes damage to the brain. About 800,000 Americans each year suffer a stroke, uh, either a first time stroke or a recurrent stroke after having one previously. And it's number one five, sorry, number five cause of death in the United States and number three cause of disability in the United States. So what are the signs of a stroke? We have an acronym that we use um, that is useful to remember the signs of a stroke and that's FAST. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty. If you have these things, it's time to call 911 and get medical attention immediately. Time is brain, and early recognition of a stroke can lead to early treatment. There are some additional symptoms that um, are sometimes seen in strokes, uh, things like sudden numbness or weakness of a leg, um, you know, confusion, and then the one that, I, that I'm going to be talking about a lot today, which is a sudden severe headache out of nowhere with no cause. So, you know, 
Additionally, more recently, people are using the acronym BFAST, which includes balance, so loss of balance, headache, or dizziness, uh, eyes blurred, and again, face drooping on one side, arm or leg weakness, speech difficulty. If you see those things, it's time to call 911 immediately and get yourself to a stroke center to get diagnosed and treated. So what can be done to prevent a stroke? So like a lot of diseases like heart disease and, and things like that, you know, strokes are usually because of accumulated wear and tear on your body uh, through life. And so a lot of the things that can be done to protect yourself against heart disease are also useful to protect yourself against stroke. There are some things we can control and some things we can't control. So risk factors that can be treated. These are things that I'm sure everyone has heard and, and uh, you know, things like hypertension, um, alcohol use, cigarette smoking, atrial fibrillation, heart disease, cholesterol, uh, diet and exercise, sleep apnea is known to be associated with strokes. Um, stress has some relation to strokes. It's, it's not exactly clear how, um, but all these things are things that you can minimize as a, as a patient to prevent strokes from happening. There are some things that we can't though, like our age, the older we get, the higher we are at risk for stroke, gender, uh, race, prior history of stroke, and family history. Strokes do run in families. We know that the older we get, um, uh, the more common strokes are. If you look at it, it's much more common in the 80 plus year old population than it is in the 20 to 30 year old population. And we know that strokes are more common in men than women. If this is just a rough estimate, but you know, if I said that there's approximately 800,000 strokes a year, you know, quite a number can be prevented potentially. Um, and the probably the biggest one, uh, the thing that you can do to prevent strokes, specifically hemorrhagic strokes, which I'm focusing on today, is controlling blood pressure and treatment of hypertension. So what can you do? Know your risk factors, exercise regularly, lower your sodium intake, cut down on fatty foods, eat a well-balanced diet. Importantly, report any symptoms to your physician or get help when you can and manage your medical risk factors. Know your numbers. So if your blood pressure is high, that's probably, as I said, the number one thing that we can do to prevent hemorrhagic strokes and strokes in general. Know your blood sugars, keep your blood sugar under control. Your cholesterol, keep your cholesterol under control. And obesity has a lot to do with stroke as well. Uh, specifically central obesity, is, it's been found. And so that's why waist size actually is independently important uh, from these other factors in determining your stroke risk. So when stroke, as I said, is a pretty general term and there's different kinds of strokes. And so just to go through what the different types of strokes are. So most of the time when people talk about stroke, they're talking about ischemic strokes. And those are also the more com most common strokes. It's like 87% of all strokes, almost 90% of all strokes. So this type of stroke is caused by a blockage of a blood vessel in your brain. Uh, you can think of it like a brain attack because it's very similar to a heart attack. You have a blood vessel in your brain that's blocked and the brain downstream from it uh, dies off and that, that's a stroke. The other type of stroke, the one that I'm going to be focusing on today a little bit, is a hemorrhagic stroke. And what that is, is when a blood vessel in your brain bursts or leaks, which causes bleeding or a brain bleed. So as I said, you know, the vast majority of strokes are ischemic, um, but hemorrhagic strokes are one of the things I want to talk about a little today, but I do want to touch on ischemic strokes. It's a very important topic. So as I said, a stroke, an ischemic stroke, you can think of like a heart attack in your brain or a brain attack. It's caused by blockage of a normal blood vessel, which leads to lack of oxygen and cell death. Usually this happens for one of two different reasons. An embolus, so that's like a chunk of clot from somewhere else in your body, like from your heart in atrial fibrillation, gets thrown off, goes up to your brain, blocks the plumbing up and causes a stroke. 
So normally, if these are the blood vessels in your brain, this picture actually depicts multiple different places where we commonly see blockages in stroke. The other thing that can happen is a thrombus can form. So actually in the blood vessel itself, due to plaque or other things, you can have a clot. So this, uh, you know, in a blood vessel, if you have a plaque, it can rupture and that can actually clot off the blood vessel and that would be a thrombus. Sometimes it's a combination. For example, in your carotid arteries, if you were to develop a plaque there, it could then break off and go up into the brain, a thromboembolism. So about ischemic strokes, again, reduced blood flow causes cell death. So by by if this is your brain, if we block blood flow to part of the brain, that part of the brain then is more prone to cell death, uh, sorry, is, is going to die off because of a lack of blood flow. And on a CT scan, we can see it in pictures that look like this. As you can see here, there's this darker area in this CAT scan. So this is a CAT scan of the head. The eyes would be up here. This is the front of the head. The back of the head is back here. And so on this picture, on the right side of the image, this part of the brain here has been damaged by stroke. And over time, you go from having what looks normal, even though the stroke has already started, to months later with cell death and, re and reabsorption of the dead part of your brain, you have a hole in your brain and that's a stroke, a chronic stroke. Time is brain. If you have stroke symptoms, and you have specifically these ischemic strokes where you have a clot in your brain, you are losing brain cells literally by the minute, 1.9 million neurons every minute. If you get to the hospital in the right amount of time, there are things we can do to help you. TPA is a drug that's given to bust up clots and restore blood flow. If that doesn't work, or sometimes in conjunction, we can actually go as surgeons, go into your brain using a minimally invasive technique and pull clot out of your brain. That's called a thrombectomy. And sometimes uh, just with medical care, we can help get you through it as well. In bad situations with bad strokes, there are times when you need a surgeon to actually do a life-saving surgery to treat brain swelling called a craniectomy. That's not what I'm focusing on today. But just to touch on it briefly, mechanical neurovectomy for stroke means that when you have a clot in your brain, we can use a small device like this called a stent retriever or a suction device to actually go into your brain, go through the clot that's blocking blood flow to part of your brain. And using this device, we can actually pull clot directly out of the brain and restore blood flow. And this is all done through just a little tiny nick in your groin or in your wrist. This just uh, is an animation showing how this works. Um, so if you're able, to, if this is a clot in your brain and there's no blood flow beyond it, with these devices, we're able to actually grab the clot and then suction it out like so which then restores blood flow to the brain and therefore prevents further cell death. If you come to the ER with a stroke at a comprehensive stroke center, what we do is we are, we are primed to move quickly to help save your life and save your brain. A doctor, you'll be will seen by a doctor within five minutes we will get an advanced CAT scan to see what the problem is within 15 minutes. And if you need the clot buster like TPA, we can administer that within 30 minutes. And if you then need further therapy, we can get you back, so we can get you into the cath lab to open up the blockage in your brain within an hour and get blood flowing within 90 minutes, hopefully less than this, but these are the benchmarks that we use. And just to touch on it very briefly, a TIA, which a lot of you may have heard of, is a mini stroke. So this happens where basically you have stroke-like symptoms, but then they go away. Now, if this happens, you cannot just ignore it. You need to get medical treatment because 5% of people that have a TIA will have a major stroke in the next two days. And 10 to 15% of people with a TIA will have a stroke in the next three months. 
So the focus of my talk today is actually on hemorrhagic stroke, which is um, a, what I think the majority of my specialty is as a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. So this is when you have bleeding in the brain, like in this picture, this white is a large blood clot in the brain. So a hemorrhagic stroke or a brain bleed is caused by a vessel bursting in the brain, which causes disruption of blood flow and can cause cell damage by pressure on the brain from the blood clot and from other things. Like, um, so while it's only, it's a minority of strokes, it's by far more fatal to have one of these, it's often more fatal to have a hemorrhagic stroke than an ischemic stroke. The different types of hemorrhagic strokes, there's two major types. An ICH or an intracerebral hemorrhage is where you have a normal blood vessel that bursts causing bleeding into the brain. I shouldn't say normal. You have a blood vessel that bursts causing bleeding into the brain, causing a clot inside the brain. The vast majority of these kinds of strokes are due to high blood pressure. This is also the majority of hemorrhagic strokes. The other type of hemorrhagic stroke is called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is where you have bleeding in, on a blood, from a blood vessel on the surface of the brain that causes blood to accumulate outside the brain. Um, and this is usually because of cerebral aneurysms. So an intracerebral hemorrhage, again, is when you have a diseased blood vessel that bursts, causing blood to leak into tissues. So a clot like this in this picture is from a small, probably a very small blood vessel that burst that caused leakage of blood into a critical part of the brain that then causes disability. So instead of cutting off blood flow and having uh, part of your brain die off because of lack of blood flow, this is you know, causing damage by having blood leak into the brain and then put pressure on the brain around it. Again, this is usually caused by high blood pressure and can be prevented by treating blood pressure. So in this picture from the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, again, these tiny little blood vessels coming off the major vessels in your brain can rupture from high blood pressure and cause bleeding into part of the brain. And that's what causes ICH. So again, usually high blood pressure. There are other causes. Another one that we see a lot of is called amyloid angiopathy. This is a disease of older patients where for whatever reason, their blood vessels are more prone to rupturing and they are more prone to having blood clots form uh, you know, in their brain, usually with lower pressures. They don't have to have high blood pressure necessarily. Um, there's other causes of hemorrhagic stroke and ICH. Um, there's a large association with um, stimulant drugs like cocaine and methamphetamines and causing this because of the high blood pressure. Um, you can develop this sometimes by having your blood be too thinned, uh, either due to disease or medication use. And then there are some other more rare things that can cause ICH, such as vascular malformations, moya moya disease, and sometimes when you have an ischemic stroke, it can then turn into a hemorrhagic stroke in a process called hemorrhagic conversion. But again, the vast majority of these types of strokes are from high blood pressure and bleeding into normal parts of the brain. So when you have an ICH, the presentation is going to be very similar to the ischemic stroke that I talked about earlier, be fast. Unlike ischemic strokes, though, it's usually associated with a severe headache. Um, also, there can be significant nausea, vomiting, and things like that. That doesn't usually happen with ischemic strokes, but regardless, if you have these symptoms, balance, lot, balance headache, uh, eyes blurred, face drooping, arm or leg weakness, speech difficulties, you need to get medical attention right away. So when someone comes to the hospital with ICH, our primary thing that we do to treat them is to lower their blood pressure, make sure that they don't have anything causing them to bleed. And that is the primary thing that we do. 
because in some ways the damage has already been done and what we're trying to do is prevent secondary damage by preventing further bleeding. Now, more and more there's been uh, talk and study about surgery for this disease. And so you can imagine that, you know, if you have this large blood clot in your brain, it will cause the pressure inside your brain to rise. So there are times when we think that going after these clots, it helps the patient. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to this. And if you were unfortunate for this ever to happen to you, I mean, it's something that you would have discussed with you in the hospital, the possibility of surgery. So we usually will do it if the brain pressure is very high um, and as a life-saving measure. There's been a lot of trials and study on this um, and really kind of the standard of care has been if it's a large clot and it's life-threatening, we'll usually go in and take it out and do a surgery to relieve the pressure. But these days now, actually, there's a lot more interest with newer technologies of removing these clots minimally invasively in order to decrease the damage to the surrounding brain that you might see from a blood clot. Um, so one of the ways that we do this is using a minimally invasive approach called the Artemis procedure. And this is a procedure that we are offering in at Mission Hospital. Um, it's a minimally invasive approach where basically you use a very thin suction device that's passed through a camera um, and you're able to remove these blood clots without doing a big surgery. So instead of doing a big surgery, remove a large part of the skull and we go through a lot of important brain to get down to a blood clot and suck it out. The idea here is that we use a minimally invasive approach going through parts of the brain that are not as important and doing minimal damage to them uh, to remove this blood clot. And we do that in a way that avoids all the major connections to the brain and, um, and does it without disrupting the normal brain around the clot. And so the device that we have looks something like this. It's a camera uh, mounted on what's called an endoscope and we put the Artemis device through it and we pass it into the brain through a little kind of drinking straw size device. So you can see if you have a clot here, we make a hole, a very small hole, pass the device into the clot and then suction it out. And then sometimes we'll actually fill up the clot with water and then make sure there's no active bleeding and then pull it out. And as long as we were able to leave the brain looking pretty normal and undisturbed afterwards. So this is actually a video of a case I did a few years ago uh, with this device. So this is looking through the camera and after I place that drinking straw into the clot, I can just suction out. You can see all this red is blood that we're suctioning out here. So it's a little bit unclear, but what's going on is we actually have computer guidance during these surgeries, so I know exactly where I am. And that dark red clot there is the, is the blood clot um, that, that the stroke caused. So we just are able to move around and using computer guidance, we know exactly where we are in the brain and we're able to remove clots bit by bit using this device until we can pull out big chunks of clot like that until we have brain that is no longer uh, you know, being pressurized by clot. And we're able to fill up the whole area with, with uh, saline solution, make sure there's no active bleeding, wash it all out and close up. And then the result is that we, so we're able to do that through a very small manually invasive incision. Sometimes the best trajectory to avoid critical structures is to actually go through the forehead. And so in this case, actually, it's a very thin line through the forehead. And when this heals up, it doesn't even, doesn't leave a scar. So we're able to do things like this, where we have quite a large clot in this patient that we're able to remove minimally invasively. And you can see here in this picture where this black thing is called the ventricle. That's a fluid space in the middle of the brain. This clot's pushing it over and causing pressure on it. And so that just gives you an idea of how much pressure there is in the brain. After we remove the clot, you can see here that now that it's kind of bounced backward. You can see that. So this is before the left two pictures, and this is after. This is another case of a smaller clot where you're able to move it and 
leaving the brain around the area basically undisturbed. This is just a video of what happens when you fill it up with water afterwards and you're able to find any small bleeders and stop bleeding before you leave, just out of interest. We actually at Mission Hospital are involved in something called the MIND trial. So this is a national uh, multi-center randomized trial for the removal of ICH. So we're trying to contribute to the world's literature on this topic. And until recently, we were actually the only center in um, California that was uh, part of the trial. Now UCLA just signed on, I believe, a month ago. But until then, you know, people are doing this surgery, but you know, we really feel it's important if we're doing it to um, to contribute to the literature on the topic and and do research on it. So this this study is actually actively enrolling at Mission Hospital right now. The other type of stroke, um, the other type of hemorrhagic stroke is something called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is the one that neurosurgeons have always been participating in uh, the treatment of. And so this is usually referring to the treatment of brain aneurysms. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, when you have a stroke like this, the symptom that you get is not necessarily the BFAST symptoms, although you possibly could, the usual symptom is the worst headache of your life. And it's very interesting because people that have never heard a talk like this or never heard about subarachnoid hemorrhage, time and again, that is exactly what they say. It was the worst headache of my life. I've never had anything like that before. It was out of nowhere, like a like lightning hit me or like a thunderclap headache. That's what it's called. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is the worst headache of your life. That's the symptom. So what this is, is bleeding around the brain or underneath the brain. Um, the usual cause of this outside of, you know, having a head injury, uh, the usual cause if it just happens on its own is from rupture of a brain aneurysm. There's other diseases that can cause this like AVMs or different fistulas, um, tumors can sometimes cause it, but brain aneurysms are the usual cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if you are unlucky enough to have an aneurysm rupture, about a third of the time, it's instantly fatal. About a third of the time, a uh, patient survives with uh, you know, moderate to severe brain damage and disability. And a third of the time, the patient survives with, with a good outcome. But this is, it's a very bad disease. It's a very bad disease. So again, just to describe it, the brain is covered by different layers. One of them is called the arachnoid membrane. It's part of the meninges. You might have heard of that term before. And when aneurysm ruptures, it doesn't usually cause a clot inside the brain, although it can. What it does is it causes blood to leak around and coat the brain, like you can see in this picture. So aneurysms about, it's really unclear but anywhere from one and a half to 5% of the, of the US population has an aneurysm. So, you know, maybe three to 5 million people. Of those people, a very, you know, a minority of them will actually have an aneurysm pop or burst. People aren't usually born with aneurysms, although we do sometimes see them in children. Uh, the risk factors for aneurysm formation are the same risk factors for stroke diabetes, smoking cigarettes, high blood pressure, but then there's some other things like family history, drug use, uh, and then there's some specific ones like genetic diseases such as polycystic kidney disease and Ehlers-Danlos. And the run that I usually see, honestly, is just bad luck. Something that just out of nowhere, you develop this, this thing for no reason and, and it ruptured. So as opposed to before, where we're dealing with these small perforating arteries, having a tiny little bubble on them that pops and leaks blood into the brain, usually we're dealing with a much larger bubble that forms on a blood vessel. And that's what an aneurysm is. So again, the classic presentation of an aneurysm is the worst headache of your life. 80% of the time, that's what it is. A sudden severe headache should prompt a visit to the ER immediately. Call 911 if you ever have a sudden severe headache out of nowhere.
the peak age for aneurysm rupture is usually in the late 50s. Um, about 30% occur in sleep. People wake up from sleep uh, with that. Um, you know, other times it can happen during Valsalva or sexual activity. Um, exercising, you know, we have a very healthy population here in South Orange County and that likes to exercise and we definitely see aneurysm ruptures during exercise. Um, about half of the time, aneurysm patients had some kind of warning symptom beforehand. I think that number is probably a little bit high, but sometimes there are warning signs. Uh, aneurysms will sometimes call what, cause what's called a sentinel hemorrhage or a, or a where, where a little bit of blood leaks out of the aneurysm, and that can, uh, can be a sign of an impending rupture. Um, but as I said, you know, some kind of headache is, is there in the vast majority of times. Other times it can be a coma, um, bleeding behind your eyes, um, you know, other things as well. So when you come into the hospital and you've had one of these kinds of strokes, um, we stabilize you medically, we figure out what the cause of the bleeding was, and then really what we have to do is prevent it from bleeding again. You can think of this, sorry. You can think of an aneurysm that has bled like a time bomb. So an aneurysm bleeding again or re-bleeding is a major source of morbidity. So if you have the sudden severe headache when an aneurysm bled and you're doing okay and you think to yourself, oh, you know, I don't really need to go to the ER, it'll just go away. You're putting yourself at extreme risk because it's, that is when we, if we, we need to, the aneurysm needs to be basically stopped from bleeding again. Otherwise, but if it were to bleed again, it's very likely to be fatal the second time. So what we will do is we'll usually do a CAT scan in the ER and that can usually tell us, yes, you've had bleeding in the brain. Um, if you wait longer than 24, 48, 72 hours after the start of bleeding to come in, a second test like a lumbar puncture or an MRI scan might be needed to make the diagnosis of aneurysm rupture. Um, usually then we'll do a, a test called a CT angiogram and that will, um, show us what the source of bleeding is, if you actually do have an aneurysm or not. And then a uh, catheter angiogram is usually next, except in certain cases where a large clot forms or something and you need emergent surgery. Uh, in the, except for those cases, usually we'll do an angiogram, which is the gold standard test to figure out um, what bled and if, how we're gonna treat it. So um, something that I really need to clarify here is that uh, the difference between ruptured and unruptured aneurysms. So sometimes we find aneurysms before they've burst. So these are called unruptured aneurysms. Like these are, they, you know, we find them because people get um, CT scans or brain imaging for some other reason and we pick them up. Um, or, you know, where we screen sometimes in certain populations, we do screen for them. And if we find them before they burst, you can avoid all the symptoms of the stroke and all the really bad situation that happens when aneurysm bursts, and we can treat them up front. And if we do that, oftentimes it can be done minimally invasively with low risk to the patient and with just an overnight hospital stay sometimes. Um, but there are risks to every procedure. And so, you know, it's very important to select which aneurysms are worth treating before they popped and which ones aren't. Not all aneurysms need to be treated. So, you know, how are some ways that you would know if you had an aneurysm and then therefore would need to be treated? So oftentimes we'll get them because you have a slip and fall and we catch it on some other picture or, you know, you're getting a workup for some other problem, headaches or something like that, and we find an aneurysm that's not the cause of the headaches. Um, rarely, like I said, you can have one of these sentinel headaches where you have a severe headache, but there's no blood, and then, but we look and you actually have an aneurysm um, that may have been about to pop. And then rarely an aneurysm can push on um, 
normal stuff like nerves and cause problems. Like in this, in this picture here, this gentleman actually had an aneurysm pushing on the nerve that goes to his eye, which didn't cause vision loss, but caused his eyelid to drop and for his eye, to, his pupil to dilate and his eye to be turned down and out. So this is actually a, a sign of, of an aneurysm. But normally we don't find them like that. If, if we find them, they have them first, it's just because someone had imaging for some other reason. That's the usual cause. So when we find an aneurysm, you know, we what happens if you were to come to see me after being found to have an aneurysm, is we end up looking at the situation and making a decision together about what the risks are of treating this thing or leaving it alone. As I said before, not all aneurysms need to be treated. We can look at an aneurysm and, and look at you and figure out, based on a number of different factors, what the risk is of leaving something alone or, the, or actually going and doing something about it. And I'll say that the vast majority of aneurysms that I see that are unruptured, we never touch. We just watch them. And if they grow or change, we might change our mind. But for the most part, we usually just watch them. Um, but you know, you need a neurosurgeon to be your point of contact to, to help figure this out with you. So the things that end up mattering, aneurysm size, the larger the aneurysm, the larger the chance of it rupturing. Uh, the location, there are some locations in the brain where we find aneurysms where it's riskier um, to have it there and we see them burst more often. Family history, people with first degree relatives who have had an aneurysm rupture are at higher risk for having theirs rupture if they have one. Active cigarette smoking is a risk factor for aneurysm rupturing. Uh, blood pressure control, something that you can do if you know you have an aneurysm, you have to make sure that your blood pressure and your blood sugar are under good control. And age, so it's not that the older you are, the higher the risk of the aneurysm bursting. That's not what it is. It's that the older you are for a small aneurysm, we might say, okay, well, looking at your aneurysm at the size it is and the location is, the risk of it bursting is really low. And if you're 80 years old, I'll tell you, honestly speaking, I don't think that you need to treat this because the risk of this thing bursting before you were to pass away of natural causes at 100 years old, because in Orange County, everyone here lives to be 100, it seems. Um, you know, if the risk is, is too high to treat it, then we don't recommend treatment. However, you know, a small aneurysm in a 40-year-old, we might make a choice to treat that up front just because they have so many years ahead of them in their life. So it's best to see a neurosurgeon who can, who can go over this treatment plan uh, go over your particular aneurysm, your imaging, and figure out a plan of care together. And it's individualized to you, to your risk factors, and to your actual aneurysm. Aneurysms come in all shapes and sizes. Like this tiny one here is about a millimeter, and this was actually a ruptured aneurysm in this picture. This one was also a ruptured aneurysm. It's a two millimeter little heart-shaped aneurysm. Uh, this was a giant uh, aneurysm that was unruptured. This was another aneurysm that was unruptured and very large. And this massive aneurysm was also unruptured. In a patient that previously had a ruptured aneurysm, there's a, you can see a clip right here from a previous treatment. So what, what are the treatments for aneurysm? So usually, you know, historically the treatments are clipping and coiling. So clipping is where we go and put a small metal clip on an aneurysm, which blocks blood flow into the weak part of the vessel and stops it from bleeding again. Coiling is where we actually minimally invasively put metal coils into an aneurysm to cause it to clot off. And when it clots off, it's no longer dangerous anymore. So clipping of aneurysms is, you know, a surgery that's been around since the 60s, although obviously we've made some advancements to make it safer and less invasive, but it does require actual surgery. It's a surgery where we go in and we kind of move the brain aside to get down to the aneurysm and we put a metal clip on it. Um, usually when we do this, it's curative. But these days, you know, I'm able to do this without actually shaving your head. This is a patient that had an aneurysm clipped. This is about 10 days after surgery. And um, you can see here that we didn't shave her head. 
I hid the incision behind her hairline. She has these little absorbable sutures that fall out on their own. And she was in and out of the hospital relatively quickly. However, because of the invasiveness, uh, doing some kind of embolization procedure is our first choice for aneurysm treatment. So this is minimally invasive. It's usually through the, done through the groin or a small nick in the wrist. Uh, there are some risks that are different from surgery, and we may choose to do surgery in some patients with kidney disease. One thing about this, though, is oftentimes it's not curative. You have to do some maintenance on it. Basically, you have to follow it, make sure that it's it's uh, that the aneurysm stays occluded, that it's not growing back. But since it's so minimally invasive, it usually is our first choice of treatment. So what that means is from your groin, we're putting a, a tube all the way up into your neck and then through that tube, a smaller tube to go all the way into your brain. And we navigate that into this little aneurysm and we deposit coils inside. And the coils are just metal coils that look like this on x-ray as we deploy them. And we're doing this in real time with x-ray guidance. We're able to fill an aneurysm like this anterior communicating artery aneurysm using metal coils done again. In this case, it was through a very small nick in the wrist. So once we are able to fill an aneurysm up with these coils and it clots off, it's no longer dangerous anymore. There are some newer technologies available uh, for aneurysm treatment. Um, and I just want to briefly touch on those. These, uh, and as time has gone on, aneurysm treatments have become safer, faster, less invasive, and we're able to do this more and more with just one night stay in the hospital. Again, this is referring to unruptured aneurysms. If we find an aneurysm, treating it before it ever pops. Um, so one of these devices is called a flow diverting stent. So if you see here, this aneurysm is coming off the side wall of this blood vessel. And instead of doing a surgery where we go and we clip, uh, put a clip across the neck of the blood vessel, in this case, we do what's called a flow diverting stent and deposit a stent across the blood vessel without ever going inside the aneurysm, which is when there's a risk of it popping. When we do this, what happens is blood preferentially flows through the stent and not to the aneurysm, and the aneurysm slowly shrivels up and fades away. And then your body actually will line the stent with cells and you'll basically grow a new blood vessel. This is a recent case where we found an unruptured aneurysm in a patient who was having imaging for another reason, this rather large aneurysm. A MAGDIN view showed that it was rather large aneurysm, about one and a half centimeters in size, which is big for an aneurysm. And we're able to place this flow diverting stent across the neck of the aneurysm inside the parent vessel, which caused immediately contrast, which is basically a proxy for blood, to sort of sit in the aneurysm and not really go anywhere. Uh, and this stasis of contrast that we see uh, is exactly what we want to see when we do this treatment. And I brought her back six months later, and this thing was totally gone. She had healed basically a new vessel, and this was deleted like it didn't ever exist. Um, more recently, I had a young patient, a 40-year-old mother, who was having headaches, um, and we found this sizable aneurysm right here, and this is called the ophthalmic region, uh, which is where the, the arteries just enter your brain. So this is kind of a tough place to get to surgically. We can operate there, um, but it's a little more difficult to get there. Um, and so it's, this is another case where definitely our treatment of choice is to use these flow diverting stents. So in her case, she had, uh, this is her aneurysm. You can't really see it well in this picture, but I just, this is after treatment, the stent is kind of sitting where these red lines are and just in the, in the wall of the vessel, which causes this thing to shrivel up and go away. The newest technology we have for the treatment of aneurysms, which has just been available for the last couple of years, is something called uh, the web device. This is probably the first one of what's going to be the next generation of technology, which is where we actually put a plug-like device into the aneurysm and block blood flow into the aneurysm. 
This doesn't require blood thinners like some of the other stents and things do. And this allows us to treat wide neck aneurysms um, that we couldn't with coils or you know, without using different technologies. Um, so this recent uh, patient is a, 70, a healthy 70 year old who was found to have this sizable aneurysm right here. She's active, healthy, no medical problems. She has hypertension that's well controlled. She's actually found to have four aneurysms on her workup. Two of them, and this she was worked up for something totally separate and found to have four aneurysms. Two of them were large enough that we thought we should treat them, and two of them we decided just to watch. And so she actually underwent this web procedure at Mission Hospital twice. Um, so you can see this is that aneurysm I was just showing you. Here it is. And we are able to just deploy this plug into the aneurysm, which immediately just clots it off. And it's like it just erased. So now she has two of these, if you can see here, one on this side, one on the other side. This was done, you know, she, both of her aneurysms were treated about two weeks apart with one night stay in the hospital each time and no surgery, nothing other than just a small nick in the groin. So I have a few cases. I mean, I, I know that we're kind of running a little short on time. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that I can get to now, but I actually have some uh, cases that we can, uh, that I was gonna go through uh, quickly if there's no questions. Um, let's see if I can access, if anyone has any questions, I can stop here or I can just go through a few of these just illustrative cases. Let's see, it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat. So I'll just go ahead and just talk about a couple of cases and just show you guys some, some cool cases. So this is a 56 year old female who woke up um, from in the middle of the night uh, from sleep with a severe headache. Uh, she had had one month prior a severe sudden headache and um, she went to an outside hospital and they didn't actually scan her or anything and they just thought she was having a headache. They gave her pain medicine. Um, it was not a stroke center. Uh, but uh, she presented to the hospital with this headache, and when we did a CT scan, we saw that she had this subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and on imaging, you know, we were able to see just this tiny little thing uh, on the CT angiogram, but when we did the actual catheter angiogram, we were able to see that there was something right here. And so she had a very, very small aneurysm right here that burst about one millimeter, two millimeters in size. And so she's admitted to the ICU. This is an emergency. So she's admitted, so admitted to the ICU. We were able to take her to surgery. And you can see in this video, this is actually in surgery. That's the aneurysm. I have a suction on the hole in the aneurysm. And we just place this little metal clip on the vessel and pinch off the aneurysm, leaving the normal vessel intact. So we were able to do that and treat her aneurysm. Unfortunately, if you have a stroke like this, we usually keep in the hospital at least two weeks to watch you because there's all sorts of other things that can go wrong after a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, but uh, she did very well. She was awake and alert two hours you know, after surgery and we sent her home two weeks later. Um, you know, Another case recently, um, actually a couple of years ago now, not recently, where um, a 77 year old woman passed out in the shower, was brought to the hospital and um, had subarachnoid hemorrhage from this tiny little aneurysm you know, in an area called the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, uh, which is in the back of the brain, a difficult place to get to surgically. Um, it's sitting right in front of your brain stem, but using catheter based procedures and minimally invasively we were able to plug this up with coils. And she did very well also in this situation. Now, it doesn't always go this well, but um, you know, definitely at times. Now, uh, another case, which is a 78-year-old female who had a slip and fall at home. And when they did a head CT, they saw something that they weren't quite sure what it was. So they did more imaging and found a very large aneurysm, this huge kind of thumb-like aneurysm uh, measured, you know, almost an inch in size. And, at, you know, normally 
at 78 years old, I wouldn't say to put someone, you know, through treatment or surgery. But what I told her was, you know, at the size of her aneurysm, there's a pretty significant chance that it could rupture. It also had some high risk features and she had been having headaches and things. And so, but I told her by no means was it certain that it was going to rupture. And so I, we talked about it and, and um, she talked to her children and decided that she wanted to, to have it treated. And so we brought her in and we were able to put a whole bunch of coils into it uh, very safely. She went home the next day, six months later, we checked on it and the aneurysm has gone. So this is the kind of outcome that, you know, that I love that we're able to do this minimally invasively and take this risk out of it bursting. So uh, with that, I'd like to open up to any questions. Uh, there's a couple minutes left. If you want to put any questions in the chat or, uh, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask, I think we'd be happy to answer them for you. Is part of your practice, my name is Ken, is part of your practice an analysis of the risk factors of individual patients and then helping to assess what the proper um, road might be, assuming things like blood pressure and uh, blood sugars are controlled? Absolutely. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I, I would say the vast majority of patients we don't treat that are found to have aneurysms. Um, you know, when you have an aneurysm, you come in and see me, it's a very individualized thing where we look at the size of the aneurysm, where it is, what your risk factors are, how old you are, what your life expectancy is. And then we figure out if we were to treat it, how are we going to treat it? And then we look at the risks of basically doing something versus the risks of doing nothing. And you have a choice, you know, you're able to choose what you'd like to do. Um, there are some things I won't do, like I won't treat an aneurysm, I think, that has a minuscule chance of bursting in a patient that I don't think needs it. But, you know, if it's a gray area, it ends up, you know, being your choice as to how you do it. And we definitely individualize that for each patient. And personally, I mean, I think it's important to go to someone that can do both kinds of treatments so we can figure out, you know, what the best treatment is. Again, most of the time we do this minimally invasively. But um, there are times when I do recommend surgery and, um, and we're able to offer both options um, at Mission Hospital and uh, help you personalize your care. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, you know, thank you for listening. Uh, these are my two crazy kids, and um, I put my website on there where you can find more information. You can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. I sometimes post uh, pictures of cases and things like that, um, and, you know, for if anyone's interested. And um, if, if there's no other questions, then thank you very much for listening, and I hope you all learned something and got something out of this today.